Hey, it's me, Canada here. You are watching the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories of individuals with disabilities or people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Today, we had the honor of welcoming John Lancaster onto our show. He was a second lieutenant in the U.S. Marine Corps. He commanded a combat infantry platoon in Vietnam where he earned a Purple Heart and Bronze Star in 1968. John retired as the executive director of the National Council on Independent Living, also known as NICL. NICL is the oldest disability grassroots organization run by and for people with disabilities. NICL advances the independent living philosophy and advocates for the full integration and participation of people with disability in society. John also served as the treasurer of the Board of Trustees for Humanity and Inclusion. Additionally, he served as a board of the United States International Council on Disabilities, also known as USID, as past president. John also served on the board of the Global Universal Design Commission and the Potsdam New York Humane Society. So a very rich career. John Lancaster, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Thank you very much, Ming. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course. So we're going to kick off with our first question. So I know that you became a paraplegic resulting from a single AK-47 round piercing your lungs and hitting your spinal column while you were serving in Vietnam. And uh, can you share with us the impact your injury has had on your life um, immediately after it happened? Immediately after it happened? Well, it was, uh, um, I almost died there in the battlefield for lack of uh, uh, a better word. I survived, uh, did triage um, and spent some time off the coast of Vietnam on a hospital ship, the USS Repose, uh, was eventually medevaced by a Da Nang and um, Guam and San Francisco and Illinois and over Air Force Base, uh, back to St. Albans Naval Hospital on Long Island and uh, did uh, initial healing and rehab there for about uh, three months. And that whole getting uh, to St. Albans took one month. So about three months into it then, then I was shipped to the Spinal Cord Injury Center at the VA Cleveland uh, Hospital in the VA Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. And there I did about eight months of uh, physical, all kinds of rehab for my spinal cord injury and was discharged in February of 1969. Uh, Went home to my parents' house and they had done some incredible things to make it accessible for me and were tremendous support and quickly learned how inaccessible and difficult my world was. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm back sure. Then, back then, you couldn't get on a bus, couldn't get in and out of buildings. You couldn't. You couldn't. You couldn't. You know. Yeah, which leads me to the next question, actually, John. Um, is what was the hardest part about you know transitioning from being an able-bodied person to someone with a disability, um, and you know using a wheelchair all of a sudden. Yeah, a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of anger, um, a lot of depression. And that was also related to the whole, you know, scene in Vietnam, because the night I was hit and got wounded, I also uh, lost four guys in my uh, platoon. They were killed. So not to mention all the Vietnamese that were killed and the 18 in my platoon that were seriously wounded. And we have no idea how many enemy were wounded. We have a good idea how many were dead, but not how many were wounded. So have guys you're responsible for killed or to kill other people. 
It's just nasty business. So it took a while to get over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Understandably. What do you wish you would have known when you first became injured that you know now about living as a person with a disability being in a wheelchair? Um, the biggest thing I wish I had known um, was the importance of physical fitness and learning how to stay there without um, overdoing it so that when you get to be my age, your shoulders still work <laughs> and, and you aren't looking total shoulder replacement surgery. So, <laughs> so if I, if I could look back and say any one thing right now, since, uh, that's, um, been a difficulty and a consideration that I never would have thought of related to disability. Um, that would be it staying fit, staying light, not too heavy, um, staying active, healthy, and um, not wearing out too fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because the rest of it's been a great life. Um, I mean, a lot of ups and downs. And it was uh, at first tough to realize that it could be so great, but it has been. And the whole experience of Vietnam and my disability ultimately defined my career and uh, the fantastic career it's been. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate just a little bit on the, you know, conserving your energy and, you know, shoulder, not straining your shoulders? Because obviously we all want to live a active, fulfilling, productive life. But what does that look like when we're trying to really balance it, you know, in the whole large span of life? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think, I think frankly, even able-bodied people haven't figured that out. You know, people who were athletic, whether they're professionally athletic or just athletic and fit, you know, to go along with whatever their day job is. But um, I don't think uh, human beings have totally figured it out, but it's even a bigger challenge uh, for other disabilities too. And uh, so what does it look like? I would say is a better understanding of what your new way of moving, so to speak, is like in a I use a wheelchair. So when you're in the wheelchair, you're, you know, you're pushing and that's a lot of use on the hands, the elbows, the shoulders, um, you know, the back muscles and probably your pectoral and a few other things. So you got to look at, um, you want to use them, you want to keep them in really good shape. Uh, but you also got to understand that sooner or later, um, cartilage, tendons start to get older and more brittle and and so there becomes a whole question of everything from diet to i'd say pacing yourself at the at the at the right pace so that you don't do damage and that's also hard for someone who has an active lifestyle like you and like i used to because my wife christine and i we We've literally traveled many places in the world um, long before there was good access. <laughs> so you'd put yourself in impossible places in impossible bathrooms. And, uh, you know, for example, when uh, you have to, you know, use the toilet in a way that you're definitely sitting on it and you're someplace in say Southeast Asia and you cannot stand or walk at all. And the only toilet is a, a hole in the ground. Then you have to start figuring out some adaptations pretty quick. 
<laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, and then what's that take in terms of your musculature to get yourself in that position? Or when you go into some impossible hotel in some place, or is now often the case in many hotels, even in this country, and you look at the bed and the bed's up about almost even with your shoulders and you're saying, how the heck am I going to get up into this thing? <laughs> you know, so you, you start to, um, you start to use your muscles in a way that might be putting undue strain on them to make do in the situation you're in and can even do uh, damage, uh, especially if your tendons and ligaments and things are starting to get brittle or mm-hmm. their supplements. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely great points um, in terms of yeah, I, I've found myself in some horrendous toilets, um, in, in as, as you probably have as well, um, having traveled as much as, you know, you have. So moving on to disability advocacy now, you've devoted your whole life to this. Um, I, uh, I got a chuckle out of this when you were, you know, as you were clerking for the Board of Veterans Appeals and in the beginning of your career, and you were recollected in one article, you said, one day, Judy Human and Jim May came down the long gray hallway. They barged into the office and said, we heard you have a law degree and use a wheelchair. We need you. I said, how do you know I'm any good? They said, we don't care. Um, we don't care. Come on. So my question is, how has Judy Human and other disability advocates um, shaped your career in terms of advocating for individuals with disabilities? Mm-hmm. Uh, huge, huge, in a huge way. Um, when, after the Marine Corps, I went uh, back to school and I went back to my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame, initially to work on a PhD in philosophy, but then I got scared. What am I going to do with that when I graduate? get my PhD, you know, (laughs) not many jobs for philosophers. So uh, I jumped to the law school. And interestingly enough, two people, Marcia and Bob Bergdorf, who were married at the time, and Bob Bergdorf's uh, been a, you know, a real lion in the disability movement too, were the first two advocates I ever met uh, for disability issues. And they were both um, teaching at the law school, or Marcia was, and Bob had just finished graduating from the law school, and they had just gotten married. And they were teaching a course called Law and the Handicapped at the time. And so they were the first people I met. And then I started to look at the relationship between my law school education and disability issues. But I really didn't think much about it. Then the only job I could get was the one you mentioned at the the Veterans Administration's Board of Veterans Appeals. And that did happen where where Judy Human and Jim May came in. and, And you just don't say no to Judy. You know, you just can't say no to Judy. So they took me to lunch. And two weeks later, I was working for the guy, Jim May, at the Paralyzed Veterans of America because Judy wanted me there so the PVA would do advocacy on transportation issues for people with disabilities, access to mass transit, um, with the what was then called the Subcommittee on the Handicap of, I think it was Transportation and Service Committee or something, or. Uh, Anyways, it was the committee that had jurisdiction over transportation. It was headed by Senator Harrison Williams of New Jersey, and Judy was working for him. And so Judy and I became close friends, and I've known her and worked with her for respect. She's done great stuff, but um, she pulled me kind of kicking and dragging a little bit right into the disability movement. <laughs> and so it was great. It was just great. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like she's 
had a you know had yeah. a huge impact on your life not only you know professionally but also personally yeah yeah and her and her husband jorge are great people <laughs> yeah they are i've had the yeah, yeah i've had the opportunity to meet them as well so you once said that we need a paradigm shift um, when it comes to employment for individuals with disabilities and uh, what 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 do we need to shift to and how can we create this paradigm shift um, and what can current leaders do to achieve this paradigm shift? Yeah, I, I think um, the more the disability community continue to can continue to push our uh, issues and the identity of people with disabilities um, to the forefront in the sense of inclusion and to the background in the sense of the differences. And I don't think we've quite achieve the balance yet because we haven't been able to educate the public that so that the public really gets it and accepts it that affirmative action supports accommodations accessibility these are all about inclusion and equaling or at least balancing out a little bit the playing field of being in life and participating and contributing. And we haven't yet found out how to sell that to the entire masses in a way that everybody gets it. A lot of people are starting to get in it, and I think we've made vast progress in that area. And I think that the more we stay in communication with and working with other civil rights efforts, whether it's the women's movement or African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, um, LBG, you know, the whole thing. And the more we move towards an inclusive uh, society, uh, then I think the quicker we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I agree with you. Then there definitely needs to be a paradigm shift with 70% of individuals with disabilities today still being unemployed. That's outrageous. Yes, um, it, it sure is. <laughs> That was one of the issues I spent a lot of my career working on was the employment of people with disabilities. And um, again, that's where the point I was just making is, is really shows up is in the area of employment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, so you once said, I also believe that we need to do advocacy with our entire society, advocacy that goes beyond Congress. When we turn down funding from corporations or organizations we disagree with, we miss out on this opportunity. What did you mean by this? Can you elaborate this further? And how do you think this will advance the rights and opportunities for people with disabilities? Um, and uh, yeah, I think is what we need is a massive um, kind of PR campaign. And I think it needs to be less centered around um, Paralympic athletes and, you know, the successful actor or actress that happens to have a disability, too, and more about around, you know, or ordinary Joes and Susies like us, you know, that are just out there doing life, you know, and that aren't, you know, next necessarily the, uh, the, uh, I hate to be disparaging of my own group, but myself, but of the 
so-called super crip that might have just won the downhill Olympic skiing thing in their class. Uh, so it's, um, uh, I think we need to create more understanding in the general society of what um, people with disabilities sometimes uh, have to go through to make it through a day and what a difference it makes to have a reason for doing that, like a job, <laughs> you know, like some independence, like recreation, like, you know, to, to be able to have a life, uh, then it's worth it, you know, it's mm -hmm. worth it getting through that day. So, and I, I, so I think, uh, to put it another way, we need a, uh, a massive PR campaign. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, in terms of there's a limit limited when you think of people with disabilities in the mainstream media, you know, you do think of Paralympics and you think of actors and um, and really trying to shift that into internalizing and realizing that the self, the socially constructed ways of the past isn't accurate and you know really need to thinking about that it's an alternative way of li living and, and that's simply what it is but the society the socially constructed infrastructure thinking isn't conducive isn't healthy for our current dis disabled population yes or any group of you know uh population that's not seen as the 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 majority um, so moving on to the C CRPD, which you've done a lot of work and a lot of advocacy in. Um, so one of the reasons that you think the U.S. should ratify the CRPD, um, for listeners who are not familiar, that's the UN Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, is that so one of the reasons that you advocated for the U.S. to ratify, which the U.S. still hasn't, right. is... For one, this is quoting you now, for one, I believe that U.S. participation on treaty implementation will yield even more progress and uh, will offer the expertise and technical knowledge that many of these countries do not have in the area of disability rights. So my question is, how do you think the U.S. ratifying the CRPD will help offer expertise and technical knowledge? to other countries who are not as advanced in the disability rights field? Well, I think, um, start with, um, people need to understand um, that we already are. Uh, but I don't think it extends in, again, into the mainstream. Uh, USAID and State Department have done some good things. Um, in terms of providing that level of assistance uh, to people with disabilities. They fund a lot of good programs, a board that um, I used to be on of uh, HI. It used to be called uh, Handicapped International. Now it's called Humanity and Inclusion. And uh, HI, for example, gets USAID support. Uh, and uh, Western European support um, for uh, doing programs like inclusive education uh, for children with disabilities, uh, like uh, fairness in healthcare and HIV AIDS uh, treatment uh, for people with disabilities. Um, they've uh, done done things in terms of employment generation. Those types of things are the things we need to be exporting to the nations of a lot of the developing world, and uh, in some cases, even to the developed world. And that is an area where I think uh, the United States has been a leader and can continue to be a leader and ought to be a leader. That's what this country's about is, is rights and 
fairness and inclusion and you know uh, letting everybody participate and everybody take their own personal responsibility and do their part to pull on the national and international war so to speak and um so the fact that our senate cannot ratify what barack obama signed the convention on on uh, you know people with disabilities yeah mm -hmm. yep and the fact that he cannot the senate cannot um ratify it i i think is a a very shameful comment about um a lot of folks in our country who are unwilling to say that yeah we believe in this and we believe in it the way we do other human rights and you know the free enterprise system and all the other things that we supposedly believe in and you know their their excuses for not doing it just don't you know don't measure up they're meaningless really no i totally agree with you it's very disappointing and we got um, we got to extend that philosophy though not just to the convention on rights of people with disabilities but it needs to be uh extended into our economic policies abroad our broader ones not just the ones that are aimed at people with disabilities but trade agreements into, you know, all this stuff. They've, it's got to become part of the fabric of our foreign policy and our foreign commerce for mm -hmm. us to properly export that. And, uh, and I just don't know um, quite how to get there. <laughs> so as you wrote, so maybe this question is, is not quite yet, um, but as you wrote, ratifying the CRPD costs nothing, will require no changes in law, and provides us the leadership opportunity to effectively guide a framework for countries to advance and sustain disabilities, disability rights in their own country. And yet, uh, unquote now, and yet the U.S. still has not ratified the CRPD. So why do you think the U.S. still has not ratified it? And um, and uh, what can current generations do to propel that forward? Yeah, I think um, maintain the activism and we need to bring the issue uh, forward again. Uh, it is a slightly new Senate. Make them, make them vote again and make them keep voting until they ratify it. So I think we need to ramp up the advocacy. Uh, uh, number one and number two, I think we we need to say, hey, the, you know, we're citizens here too. We vote too, and uh, uh, we think this is something that our country should be proud of, disability rights, and that should be exporting in all of our policies. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up question on that is, why do you believe so strongly that we should? Um, sign on to it even though you know as you were as i was quote, quoting you earlier there are no law changes and no costs and um mm -hmm. those things involved yep well um um because number one i don't think we're a selfish selfish nation and we've got some good things going here but believe me started here would be a better word we're far from done we've got a long way to go ourselves but we have so much we can teach other parts of the world too and um why be selfish number one you know it's a uh, the like buckminster fuller used to say um we live on spaceship spaceship earth and everybody down here is crew and so it's like, you know, people got to um, start participating and to participate. You have to make some accommodations. You have to do some accessibility. Uh, you have to do some education. 
you have to make sure people have economic opportunity. And that's what I like to think this country's been about. And why we shouldn't be promoting that is beyond me. So um, I don't know what to say other than that. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it is. I definitely understand its importance. And I think you're right, putting it up to a vote again and, you know, bringing it up again. Um, hopefully, you know, the world was, results will be different given the change in mindset. Um, so moving on to collaborating, you know, with other countries, bilateral, multilateral c- collaborations, you served as a representative for disability employment policy in discussions between the European Union and the United States under the new transatlantic agenda so from 2004, two, from 2000 to 2004, um, you served as a policy advisor to the Vietnamese government to develop disability law policy and programs in Vietnam. And then as executive director, as a, executive director of NICL, um, you led uh, NICL in forming their international committee to advancing the independent living philosophy for worldwide um, and then you know you served on the board of the US International um, Council on Disabilities and and you ex- assisted in advocating for the ratification and implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities which we talked about just a little bit earlier and you've also been involved on the international front working with the you know dis- disabled organizations and governments worldwide. So my question with that long um, summary of just some of your amazing career is, what is the key to collaborating and working with such a wide network and such a diverse group of people in pushing these agendas for and pushing the disability rights issues forward? Um, I think the main thing for me is communication. Um, you, uh, number one, uh, being a really good listener and observer and seeing what the situation and the concerns are um, of the other folks involved. You know, and whether you're uh, pushing an agenda and having to do some advocacy or whether you're uh, coming to a meeting of the minds with, say, another group of disabled people in, for example, Vietnam, which you mentioned. And when I was over there working with the government, um, uh, interestingly enough, I was on a USAID, I was being paid through a USAID grant by a U.S. nonprofit called uh, Vietnam Assistance uh, for the Handicap was her name, VNAH. And, um, but who I answered to was the Vietnamese government. So it was kind of a, you know, you had different bosses and different sources. But anyways, the the key thing there is when I started working with um, uh, my disabled colleagues, um, my counterparts that were Vietnamese, especially in Hanoi and in Ho Chi Minh City and in certain other larger cities, as well as uh, some more rural provinces too. And we, we were effective in forming good uh, networks of uh, people with disabilities that were starting to get into the, into the conversation. And I used to try and communicate how we do things here in the United States, uh, not only in the sense of our vast wealth and materialism and construction and all the stuff, but uh, in terms of our laws and all that. And at the same time, I had to listen very closely to them and understand their culture their situation and do the observations. And we used to have some extremely good conversations. And the type of advocacy that always works here doesn't necessarily work in Hanoi. 
You know, it's a different, it's a different culture. It's a different mindset. It's a different way of doing things. Um, it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be advocacy. It doesn't mean that there shouldn't be um, push and give and take. Uh, but the way that you accomplish that might be very different. So I, I think, to me, working with all of those diverse groups really was a question of listening, observation, communication, discussion, and coming to a shared consensus that, that would move the action forward. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate just a little further on what advocacy looks like in Vietnam and how that differs from advocacy here in the U.S.? Um, yes, uh, and I think it's still the case today, uh, at least to some extent and on some issues. Um, but in the U.S., you know, we're quick, for example, to make a political point when we're not um, when we're not, uh, how do I want to say, when we're not getting anywhere through. So I, you know, it's a, a little harder to do a uh, um, kind of an angry protest demonstration in, uh, in Hanoi, or certainly it was at the time, uh, say, than it would be for us to uh, be doing something like blocking traffic or uh, holding a big rally or, uh, um, you know, doing something uh, like that uh, in downtown Hanoi in front of one of the uh, government uh, buildings. Um, but that being said, the Vietnamese have their own way of kind of making those same points that, that were, I thought, uh, equally effective. So it, it's um, an example of that would be is a, they like events in parks and if they can get the right people there, invite them, um, kind of get them to say something, uh, put them on record saying the right thing. You know, it's a, it's almost, I mean, we do some of that here that too, but the, their way of doing it is um, uh, a little more subtle. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it, it has a way of uh, um, uh, producing results, maybe not always as fast, but uh, moving the action forward. Mm -hmm. So that'd be yeah. one example. So what are your views on how the different disability rights collisions collaborate together in the U.S.? And if, if relevant, what can be improved in, term, in terms of cohesiveness, establishing a unified agenda between the different coalitions? Um, I think it's, uh, I actually think it's extremely important. We never would have gotten the ADA without that, the Americans with Disabilities Act, without that level of cooperation and coordination and coming together of the disability community, including parents of uh, children with disabilities. It just wouldn't happen. We would not have had uh, the political um, ability to have gotten it done. And, and we also built coalitions, uh, coalitions in doing so across civil rights lines. Uh, we had um, some unions of supporting uh, the ADA. We had uh, various civil rights organizations supporting it. Uh, besides the disability groups, we had uh, uh, veterans organizations supporting it. You know, you, it, it, the more you can build that collective joint will and common vision, uh, you know, the more likelihood you're going to get it to happen. So uh, to my mind, it's essential. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think of the current um, disability coalitions and, you know, the 
the current movement and organizations are seeking to to push the the issues forward? Um, let me say this: I I'm a little out of touch with what's going on in Washington and the state capitals these days. Uh, being an old retired guy, um, but. Um, I live in Potsdam, New York. We're a very rural community in a small village with two small universities, Clarkson University and SUNY Potsdam in very northern New York as crow flies about 15 miles off the Canadian border at the St. Lawrence River. Um, or 20 miles maybe. Um, but the disability rights movement is virtually non-existent up here. People follow accessibility laws and there's a little bit of hiring going on that in the old days never would have gone on. And people were more out in society and that's a good thing. But in terms of general news, except for an occasional spot on national public radio or something, we have not a clue what's going on in the disability movement in except through the internet. So the, to the extent that you're hooked into maybe a show like yours or email, which I know a lot of people are, um, you're not, you know, you're just not that. I don't think the movement has gotten to the point so that in most cases when their representative is home at vacation time or when they take a recess or when their senator is visiting their area up there that they're up there in the crowd at a town hall raising their hand and asking what are you doing about ratifying the convention on the rights of people with disabilities what are you doing about whatever the issue is? You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you might you might see the union guy there or the uh, the um, person that's concerned about an environmental issue, but rarely do you see someone saying, you know, what are you doing about? Uh, making sure everybody has uh, supports in the home if that's what they need. Mm -hmm. No, that's a really important point. I think I think that should also be a call to action for current individuals with disabilities as well who, you know, don't realize perhaps the history and how, how hard that your generation worked and um, to make everything as accessible as it is now even though we have miles to go but we have gone a long ways in achieving a lot of things as well and because of because of your generation and the work like you and judy human and, and many many others ed roberts um so you once wrote that you know veering of uh, just switching the subject just a little bit, um, going back to Vietnam, you once wrote that in 1968, as a young Marine, I was medevaxed from Vietnam with a spinal cord injury received in combat. In August 1996, I returned to Vietnam as an official in the Clinton administration. So what I'm curious about is, how was going back to Vietnam all those years, despite, you know, such a tremendous injury that incurred while you were there last? Um, the first time I went back was very emotional. My, my wife, Christine, and I went back as a result of a man by the name of Chan Van Ka. Uh, who came into my office, uh, actually a colleague of mine at the pre old President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, Paul Hippolytus, brought um, um, a um, this Chan Van Ka into my office, and 
he said, I want your agency to work with me uh, over in uh, Hanoi. And I was like, well, wait a minute here, you know. And at the time, it was very sensitive politically because uh, the U.S. government uh, had just, this was actually late 95, but the U.S. government had just ratified um, political relationships, normalized relationships with um, Hanoi. Uh, an, an amazing journey for me because uh, uh, Vietnam, um, kind of the word and the meaning to me, changed from a war to um, a culture, a people, a great nation, um, a lot of friends, a job, and it no longer was about the war. It was about this great culture that I finally got exposed to. And people, wonderful people, good friends. Yeah, I, I think in in some aspects, it must have felt like, you know, um... The word that comes to mind, no, is not is. Um, reconciliation? Did you? Yeah, in- yeah. I never I never felt like I was doing conciliation work. I felt like I was uh, uh, working with people to advance the rights of people with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, uh, I didn't see it as building relations between the two countries. I know it was. And frankly, um, I never witnessed any overt hostility or resentment from any Vietnamese because I was, you know, a ex-U.S. Marine or once a Marine, always a Marine, but a U.S. Marine who had fought over there. In fact, one of my best friends in in Hanoi was uh, Mang Tuan, and uh, uh, Tuan and I uh, um, were the same age. Both had spinal cord injuries at the level of T5, 6, and were wheelchair riders. Um, Both had fought in the Wei Phu Bai area in uh, Vietnam, and uh, he he was a, a leader in the disability movement over there, and particularly among disabled veterans. And he and his wife uh, uh, lived in the old quarter and ran a Chinese medicine shop. A very successful one. So he was an example of a, uh, a Vietnamese soldier from Hanoi who had fought against uh, Americans and we became really good friends. Mm-hmm. Very, you know, beautiful story. So now we come to our last question. Um, we've taken up way too much of your time than I thought. Um, so last question is it's something to think about, to chew on for the future. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing individuals with disabilities as a whole today, you know, both domestically and internationally? And um, how can we go- overcome these challenges as a group going into the future? Um, the biggest challenge is the current state of economic inequality here and abroad. One thing, uh, Um, is, in my opinion, is that discrimination against any group of people lessens, at least, doesn't necessarily go away, but lessens a lot if uh, the minority group member uh, has a lot of money in their pocket and is successful. And... uh, And people with disabilities, except on rare occasions, um, are not going to get to that level unless we have true economic equality and the ability to get decent jobs 
and to work our way up in the you know the economic ladder so to speak and to share in the opportunities that are available um, when you have um, resources financial resources the ability to travel uh, the ability to go get further education and learn something new to learn about art to participate in sports uh, to do a variety of things so um, I'd say that's the biggest challenge going forward. The, the other point, what can we do about it? We got to keep up the advocacy, but not just with government. We got to start advocating with corporations. We got to start playing hardball with everything from hotels um, to local educational institutions to, um, and we're doing some of that. I'm not saying none of it's going on, but you know, we need to, I think, ramp it up a little bit <laughs> or a lot yeah or a lot yeah yeah no i i agree with you and i as i was saying earlier i think you know your advice your practical advice and your um very um because you're talking about observations early and just observing the realities of life and you know how powerful having that economic freedom could be yeah. Rather that be pushing an, an issue forward or just, you know, personal independence. It's it's all very important and uh, and uh, a reality that we need to internalize and then do something about that after we internalize it. And, you know, despite the despite the barriers that are in front of us. Thank you so much, John, for coming on to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. We've had such a rich conversation with you today so thank you thank you ming and it's been a pleasure to be with you and to and to do this interview thank you now john and i would love to hear from you what is the place that you have gone back to but you had sad or tragic memories of in the past and have with were conciliated with in the present did you like this video if so Please share with your friends and follow us on social media. Additionally, please subscribe to our email list where the best conversations happen. Keep learning new perspectives. Keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and everyone else. Thank you so much for watching today and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trapes and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Bye bye.